Good evening and welcome to the Asia Society. Well, at least the virtual Asia Society. Uh, I'm Rachel Cooper. I'm the Director of Global Cultural Diplomacy and really delighted to be hosting tonight's program, which I'm sure you'll agree is very exciting. Uh, three really important uh, figures from our, our Asian American community, our playwriting community, our arts community, um, and really the imagination of, of what it means to me to think what is it to be human and what is it to be American and what is it to have an imagination. So uh, I am really thrilled. This is part of our Asian American Pacific Heritage Month programming and also part of our off the uh, beaten track programming, I suppose I would say, meaning that we're not in our auditorium and we're online virtually, but uh, in some ways it allows us all to meet through this wonderful medium of technology. And tonight we have Yip Tran, who will be uh, moderating our program with Francis Ju and Lauren Yi, as I mentioned, two of my favorite uh, performers. And let me just say a little bit about Deep, and then she will come in and introduce our speakers. Deep is currently the features editor of Broadway.com. She was previously the senior editor of America Theater Magazine, where she led the creation and launch of americantheater.org, the first official website for the magazine. Her writing has appeared in the New York Times, Playbill, CNN, Hello Giggles, Time Out New York, Backstage at Salon, among others. And she is a judge for the 2020 Obie Awards and 2020 Drama Desk Awards. But we're thrilled that she has found time to be with us tonight. Deep, please take it away. Thank you so much for the introduction, Rachel. Like, hello everyone watching virtually. So I'm going to introduce our two panelists for tonight, but using my own original flair because you've all read the bios and you, and so why, why, why do you need to read it for you? So uh, our first panelist is, is Francis Ju, Ju, Dre? Sorry, sorry Francis, I did not, Ju. Ju. I always thought the E was in there somewhere. Sorry, sorry. It's just fancy. <laughs> <laughs> so Francis Jew did two big plays this past season in New York mm -hmm. City, Soft Power mm -hmm. by David Henry Huang and Janine Tesori, and Cambodian Rock Band by Lauren Yi. His other credits include M. Butterfly on Broadway, Pacific Overtures, Thoroughly Modern Millie. If you can name a play that features Asians or Asian Americans, he's probably been in it. And he's also a recent Lucille Lortel Award winner for his performance in Cambodian Rock Band and as a two-time Obie Award winner. So, so we, I'm a big fan of Francis because I've seen him in so many works. And I, and I don't think we've ever gotten to actually talk at length, so I'm really excited about this experience. Thank you, Francis. And our second panelist is Lauren Yi, who is the second most produced playwright in America this season, according to yep. American Theatre Magazine. And I'm not just saying that because I helped that list together, but I think that's a big deal. And her play, Cambodian Rock Band, was produced in New York this season and was nominated for every single New York Theatre Award, short mm -hmm. of the Tony Awards, but one day she will get there mm -hmm. and it's going to be amazing. And her other plays include The Great Leap and King of the Yees, which also starred Frances as her dad. Mm -hmm. And uh, she's, uh, she's also writing on the television adaptation of Min Jin Lee's Pachenko for Apple TV. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you want to watch the Asia Society's interview with Min, that's also on YouTube. So welcome. Thank so you. Thank you here. for hosting. Yeah, so, well, first off, I, I, for those of the audience who haven't seen Francis or Lauren's work, can the, two, can the two of you talk to me about, like, you know, theater seen as a very elitist art form, maybe expensive to some people. So growing up as young Asian Americans, why did you pick this particular medium 
to be a storyteller? I, okay, I, I'll go first because I, I think I had a story that came to mind. Um, I was actually talking to someone about it today. Is that so? Like, my earliest experiences in theater were producing theater long before I actually knew how to make theater. Like, growing up, I wasn't in the school play, I wasn't like in drama class. Um, but for some reason, when I was in high school, I decided that I wanted to do theater uh, and I wanted to create a theater company. Um, and so having never actually been through the process of like doing a new play before or writing one, you know, or, be, or being taught how to do these things, I was like, I'm just going to come up with the structure on my own and I'm going to figure it all out. And, and so I assembled kind of a group of people who happened to just be a lot of Asian American student, high school students uh, to do this with me. And it was like, it was the blind leading the blind in a certain way of like, nobody had been in a play before. Nobody knew what a stage manager did. Um, but what it, I think, instilled in me was this sense of we're going to figure it out and we're going to kind of gather people who might not normally be in the space, basically our, our friends and family, and, and we're going to do this for them and make them all a part of it. And so I think that experience really of being a producer and a community organizer as like my first theatrical experience was something that I think left a big impression on me and I think has continued with many projects I've been a part of up through kind of Cambodian rock band, you know, at Signature, like the, the same things, you know, that I did with it, the Asian American nights that we had um, for Cambodian rock band are really the same things that I did, you know, for my theater company X number of years ago, that, that I think the, the intent and like, the, the invitation you're offering to people, uh, it has not changed really. People, people go to the theater for many things, but one of the reasons they go is to be part of something and not just to experience stories, but to experience them all together. And I think just like I was very pleasantly surprised uh, and reminded of like that power Yeah, Lauren, you're so organized and you're so um, aware as you're working and, uh, and producing of the audience and of engaging the audience. And um, I, I, I really love that. That's, that's unusual, at least in my experience. Um, but it, it, it is very related to how I became um, an actor as well. I, I think I always was an actor, but I didn't know it because I grew up in a family with nine kids um, and my dad was an engineer for the Navy. My mom uh, uh, processed checks at a bank and um, we weren't a theater going family at all. We, we you know, watched musicals on TV um, and The King and I was one that we would always, always stop to watch when it was on, um, loved it. But one of my older brothers, Jeff, when he was a senior in high school, got cast as Prince Chula Longcorn in The King and I, um, the high school play that year. And um, he asked me to help him learn his lines. And for whatever reason, I just knew how to rehearse. I just, I, I gave him direction. I gave him um, notes on his posture and his choreography. <laughs> I gave him line readings. And you know, I was in eighth grade. Um, and when I went to go see it, it was the very first time I'd ever seen um, a live musical. It was my first experience of a musical live. And my brother and the guy playing the king were the only Asian people that I remember in the company. Everyone else was white. But as far as I was concerned, 
they were all Siamese. I mean, as high school students are, they were so invested. They, they were honoring those characters. They weren't sending them up. Um, this was long ago enough that, you know, we weren't as ironic as we are now. And so they were just doing it really earnestly. I remember the, the girl playing Mrs. Anna was genuinely crying, reading the letter from the king at the end of the show. And I, I was a shy kid who couldn't talk to other people. I was underweight, I was pimply, I was so shy. Um, my, my folks worried about me, actually. Um, and, and yet, while watching that show, I knew I was an actor. I knew that this was my temple. Um, I knew that this was a way that I could find my community and I, I could express myself that I could be open to hearing other people as well. Um, and, uh, and, and so just, just today, actually, I was texting back and forth with my brothers and sisters, um, blaming my brother Jeff for the fact that I'm an actor all these years later. And, and he didn't become an actor, right? Or did no, he? no, no. He was great in the show, by the way. Um, and he's, he is, the funniest one of our brother, of my nine, um, my generation of nine kids. Um, but he's, no, he's uh, uh, an engineer. He works for in, um, energy companies, you know, creating the power grid, this, the, you know, I mean, he's, he's like really smart. Wait, are there any other creatives in your family, Francis? I have, well, Everyone in my family grew up um, uh, tinkering on the piano, um, uh, singing. We, we, when we were kids, um, we were like the Von Trapp family. We would put on, you know, shows, variety shows in our living room for each other. Um, so in that sense, we were, we were um, artistic or theatrical, but um, uh, uh, so, I have a brother who's an architect. I have um, another brother who is a, an Imagineer and is sort of the artistic head of Tokyo Disney. Um, and I have many nieces and nephews who uh, sing, play instruments, um, are uh, dancers, um, but I'm the only one in the biz who has to do it for a living. Good for you. Um, so, so so both of you going into the industry, like you didn't have a lot of models for how to do this properly. And so uh, I, as you're advancing and you're in this position right now where the two of you are, you know, you're, you're the go-to for a lot of artists in terms of, you know, acting or as like a playwright that, that you would want to produce. And so how did you learn to like make that space for yourself so that other people would know that you know, you exist and that you have a mm. voice that's not, that's, you know, that's different than, than any other voice. Mm. You know, that's a really interesting question because I don't often ask myself that. I'm, I don't often concern myself. I, there are a lot of, uh, every once in a while I get invited to speak to um, students who are in drama school and um, almost inevitably it comes down to um, a discussion of type. They're being told they need to figure out what their type is and they need to perfect their type. They need to sell that type. And so they inevitably ask me, how do I, how, how do I discover what my type is? How do I best sell my type? And I'm like, well, you're a human being. And um, because I never went to drama school, maybe, I just don't think of myself that way. I don't think of, even when I was younger, I mean, I was always like, so what? I'm a, I'm a short, little Asian guy. I, I, that's not, and, and, and what roles are there who, for short Asian guys? Let's see. I mean, there's a short Asian guy who can be in Guys and Dolls. There's a short Asian guy who can be in Cabaret. There's a short Asian guy who can be in Cambodian rock band. You know, it's like, it's you, the human qualities that you have, not 
just your physical appearance or your voice type or your gender or your sexuality. It's like, what, what do I relate to? How, what do I have in common with all of humanity? And how, how closely do I um, identify with those things? That's my type is all of those things, which is why I guess people have said, okay, why don't you play Melina in Kiss of the Spider Woman? Why don't you play the MC in Cabaret? Why don't you play Bushy in Richard II? You know, as well as playing Butterfly, uh, as well as playing, you know, a mass murdering war criminal in Cambodian rock band. Yeah. But maybe just like a follow-up question, Francis, because I'm sure like, you know, there are many things, like you have kind of tackled a wide, enviable range of roles, but are there certain things that you find yourself drawn to or that people come to you for when they're looking for, for like a certain performer? Well, I do, I do know that I, I never um, have, I've never done a play where I just, put on a pair of pants and walk into my living room and have a meal with my family. Um, that's, <laughs> that's like, I, I, I wouldn't even know how to do that gig, you know, because I'm such a ham. Um, I, I do get asked to do a lot of really extreme things. I mean, um, there are a lot of plays where I've died. There are a lot of plays where I, you know, uh, or I have to kill somebody, you know, um, there are a lot of plays where I, I have done stuff where I'm really an extremist. Um, and uh, I feel lucky um, that I've gotten to do that. But yeah, I, you know, I didn't die in King of the Yees, um, you're, you're, where yeah. I got to play your dad. Um, but he, even, even then, he was just a, an outsized personality. Yeah. And, you know, a really gregarious guy, mm -hmm. um, so not like me in real life, but uh, I don't know about that, but <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, I, I went, I was, you know, wondering this with Deep earlier today about you and and how you mm -hmm. write this wide range of play, uh, mm -hmm. you know, dealing with so many different subjects, and but they also have very different forms and 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 encompass like people from Chinatown, people from China, people um, who are older and younger, people who are mass murderers, you know, uh, people going through genocide. And, and it's just remarkable that all of those are coming out of you. Mm. I, I think that, um, I, th I think like I like to respect whatever the play decides it wants to be. Because I, I think, mm. I, I usually find that like I'll have the idea and like something that I'm really jazzed by and then in order to properly write it you just have to kind of follow it for a long time that like like and this sounds crazy but literally you'll kind of feel it in your bones if you're like this should be 90 minutes all the way through or this should be two acts like you kind of get the feel of like how many characters it should be Hmm. That, that there are certain plays where you're like, this happens in two timelines and we go back and forth. Um, or like almost like you could literally draw what the shape of the play is. And you kind of only know that by following it and like going down that rabbit hole and you just have to respect like what this particular thing wants to be. And so I think like the more I stay open to that, like the easy the easier it is to be like okay you just have to figure out you know and like let the play reveal itself uh that that there are things when i start that are true and central to the play that i don't know yet um like i like i always say like in my play the great leap one of the central relationships of the play that is kind of so obvious once you know it i didn't know it uh, when i started and i was like very stuck i was like I have all these pieces and I know what everyone's concerns are, but I don't quite like this doesn't fit together yet. Um, and eventually it's, it's kind of like magic that you're like, Oh, I see you move this piece over here 
and that's how it all fits together. Um, that reminds me of this wonderful um, drama teacher and music mm -hmm. teacher that I met at Stanford when I was working on the West Coast mm -hmm. one time. And she asked me to come to her apartment to give me a note on the opening night of Cabaret. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're all exhausted. We've been in preview and tech and, and <laughs> uh, you know, eight in the morning, I have to drive over to her apartment on the day that we were to open. And she had been an opera singer at the at New York City Opera, and now she was teaching at Stanford, and she was mm -hmm. so wise. And she said, there are times when you have a part that is so good, it's, it's better not to try to control it. Mm -hmm. Don't try to tell the story. Allow the story. Allow the MC to play. Don't try to play the MC. You'll never win. And it's and, and I, I swear, I, the last 30 years have been about trying to figure out exactly what she meant. And, and it's really about like, okay, I, I'm not a war criminal. I've never run a tortured prison camp um, that anyone knows of. And, uh, I, and yet it's my job to give over to that not to try to manipulate the audience into believing me, but to believe how much I have in common with that and um, understand it. Not, not ask for sympathy or um, to explain, but to truly just understand um, and, and not try to predetermine every moment. Yeah, well, on, uh, on that. that note, let, let's give our, yeah, let, I feel like we should give our viewers some context about Cambodian rock band. Oh, where, yes. where, yeah, where, where if, if you haven't seen it, it's about the Khmer, the Khmer Rouge. Francis plays a war criminal who is responsible for a lot of people dying. But it's also a comedy, and there's mm -hmm. rock music in it. So um, I'm going to share a clip from the show, and then we'll talk more about how these two approach storytelling. Wait a minute. Ah, there it is. Niri works for the International Center for Transitional Justice, and she's trying to take down Doik. He's the head prison guard for a prison called S21. Doik is based on a real life person a mass murdering war criminal during the Khmer Rouge reign in Cambodia. Cambodian rock band is an intimate play with epic rock and roll music. It'll have you laughing, crying, and at the same time dancing with joy. It's about both the great atrocities and magnificence that humans are capable of. And the characters are not victims. We are fighters and we are creators. It really changes the dynamic of relationships through the audience. And I have literally seen Cambodian parents go, I never talked about this in my life because I watched this play. I can talk about it. Or at least because the fiction was presented. Let me give you my fact. And they do. And it's a way for us to literally heal through the play, through the process. And I could not have asked for anything more working on this play than that fact alone. So true. Ah, oh, it's mm. so good. It's so good. I saw it twice. Yeah. I'm so sad that <laughs> it's not playing anymore. I know. So, so Laurie and Francis, um, you two have done works where it's about Asian Americans and Asians and mm -hmm. works where it's not about Asian Americans yep. and Asians. And Cambodian rock bands are one of those things where it's very, you know, specific. Like you can't replace mm -hmm. these characters with any other race. It's about being Khmer. Mm -hmm. And so what kind of different considerations do you have to give to a work like that where it's just so specific and it just means so much to a group of people? Yeah. And I think, you know, the thing that I'll also throw in there is like, I'm someone who isn't Cambodian American. It's not history that I was familiar with growing up. So in many ways, um, you know, I'm, I entered this story 
and this subject matter as an outsider. Um, and so I think that there is, you know, deep consideration to what you are putting up there on stage because there are just a, you know, fewer of those stories being told. And you're also assuming that this is a play for an, a, a, you know, American audience, theater going audience. It's an audience that probably primarily doesn't know this history. And so for some of them, there is a great responsibility on your part, you know, or my part as the writer to figure out like, what, what, what am I trying to communicate on stage and how to responsibly tell that story in a way that gets up all the information up there that has, uh, I think a compelling portrayal of that, that history that just, it, it has to do so many things at the same time. Um, and I think, you know, on top of everything you also have to do, like as a writer to tell a story. Um, and, it, and it's a very tricky tight rope to walk, um, especially if you're like interested in, in kind of shifting tonally that the play at times is a comedy and also is a very like deep, exploration of morality, that it gets very dark and characters do um, questionable to terrible things um, over the course of the play. So there's a lot of bal balancing to do. Um, so given all that, I think one of the guiding principles when I was writing this play or thinking about any play um, is that if you can pick one person that this play would get it right for. Because like, you're gonna write a play and everyone's gonna have a different opinion. And some people are gonna think, it's a great play, it's a terrible play, you got it right, you didn't get it right. If you can pick one person um, who would watch this and go, yes, you did good. Um, for me, I think this play, like the, if I had to choose just one person, I think it's a second generation Cambodian American um, who hopefully will identify or have some opinion about the father-daughter relationship. Um, that to me, the play is about uh, the intergenerational struggle and, and about how what happened in Cambodia, you know, in the 1970s has an impact on a young woman who was born and raised in America today. Um, and, and to me, that is, that is really what the play is about, about how trauma can travel between countries and generations and leave a lasting imprint on the next generation and how to deal with that and how to reconcile and heal um, that wound. So uh, there, there, are many, there are many things um, that come into play, especially with something like Cambodian rock band. Um, but that's, that's a little bit of how, how I deal with it. Yeah, that's a, such a perfect articulation of this whole question of authenticity mm -hmm. that people like us in this business have to cope with, that people like us in America mm -hmm. have to cope with. I mean, we, we're constantly um, being asked where we're really from, mm -hmm. and um, we are, we are um, the perpetual foreigner. We're, we're never American enough. Um, we're, we're being asked um, even by, you know, presidential candidates to prove our Americanness by, you know, wearing red, white, and blue, and, you know, all kinds of things. And, and that holds true in the theater as well, where people who don't look like us don't have to somehow authentically be Puritan in order to do, you know, um, uh, uh, the Scarlet Letter. You know, they don't, they don't have to be authentically French 
to do a Moliere play. They don't have to be, um, you know, even authentically uh, of, you know, to do August Osage County, you know, uh, it, it, no one asks a white person whether they are being authentically American enough to, for us to be able to identify with them as human beings. And, and I'm, I'm hyper aware of the fact that when I appear on stage, um, I, I'm not a, a, a character first. I'm not even a human being first. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a messenger from a foreign land who needs translating, who is letting people into this exotic experience that they've, that, you know. And so um, it, one of the first tasks that people like us have to do is sort of break through that barrier, um, that, that lens and, 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 and for them finally to look at us as a character as then maybe somebody that they identify with or disagree with or whatever, but relate to on a human level. Um, that, that's, that's not to say that I'm, I'm overly concerned about how the audience is um, tracking the story. Um, a, a long time ago, when I was working on Thoroughly Modern Millie, actually, which was really challenging. I mean, it's a fun, funny, lovely sort of Valentine to New York City, this show. It takes place in the 1920s, and I was playing a Chinese immigrant in the 1920s, working in a laundry. And, um, and it was really, I helped uh, from the very beginning of the development of the show, um, create the show. And, and I, I had to struggle a lot with um, the fact that I wasn't the writer um, and, and the writers were asking me for feedback. But I, you know, uh, whenever I asked for a little bit more space in the show to express the, the, these Chinese characters' needs, the way that other characters' needs were expressed, I was told, well, you know, you're, you only get this much space because here's the A story, here's the B story, you're the C story. Okay, fine. But I told them, you know, it, this, um, it's, it's going to be possible for people to do the show, not us, but for other people to do the show and for it to be offensive. Um, you're not making the show foolproof. And they were like, oh, well, we, we believe what you're doing is noble and, and human. And, and I'm really proud of what we did at Thoroughly Modern Millie on Broadway. But there are other people who have done it other ways now. And so, you know, um, I, I think it's a, it's a really challenging question, that question of authenticity and whether or not we're ever really doing our job. Um, uh, you know, I'm not Khmer, so I had to look at Cambodian rock band and say, um, how is, do I as a human being relate to this specific human being under those specific circumstances? I did um, some reading. Um, Lauren gave me a couple of books to read. Um, I did a lot of Googling. Um, and uh, I also did some reading about um, torture victims. Um, and, um, but at the end of the day, the character I was playing, you discover very late in act two, is also a father and a husband and a teacher. And um, so I focused on those things and, um, and, and then relied on people like the wonderful Joe No to tell me if anything I was doing was um, so out of the realm that it, it, it just couldn't be um, what a Khmer person would do. And our fabulous director, Che Yu, as well. Uh, do the two of you ever wish that you could, that, that you didn't have to balance the whole, oh, I need to represent the Asian American community in a certain way versus, oh, I just want to be an artist, like white people are artists first. 
Oh, totally. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be great? Or, to, or just, I think, to even approach like a piece of, a, a piece, just like I'm going to tell a story about a family and, and not have to worry, I think, about, I think, representation or diversity or how it fits into the whole theater landscape at the very beginning. Because I do think it's something that one should always consider, but it, it would be like great just to like think like in the very beginning when you don't have to like even plan a production yet or you don't even have a play just to be like, there's three people. Because I find even when it's not necessarily like an Asian American specific story or like a culturally specific story, I think even when I'm starting, I'm like, well, who would you cast in this? If, uh, do you imagine they're white? Is there a reason dramaturgically that they're white? Is the whiteness baked into the themes? Is it around, I don't know, privilege or something else like that? And you go down the rabbit hole um, and, it, and it just takes more effort. Not to say the effort is not valuable and useful, but man, it'd be nice to just be like, there are three people in a living room and, and, I, don't, and I don't know anything else yet. Yeah. And one of them is Francis. Yeah. I don't know what that would be like. I mean, yeah. that's the thing is I, I kind of feel like um, the, the, all of the reasons why I'm mixed up because I'm not really Chinese, but I'm Chinese. You know, what do I know about China? Um, and yet my sense of being American is completely influenced by being not white too. So that's my version of being American. So all of those sort of challenges that throw me off balance are part of my secret sauce, I think. It's part of why I think I'm in this business. It's, it's what I draw from. I'm, I, you know, this is the only tool that I've got. Mm. So I, I have no idea what it would be like to not think about representation. You know, um, there are different people who have different ideas. I mean, some of the young people I talk to say, I will never play a servant. I will never play somebody with an accent. I never want to play a person of color that is written by a non-person of color. And I will, you know, I never want to have to speak another language. And I'm like, wow, that's a lot of things you don't want to do. And all of those things are, you know, potentially human beings too, you know, who have their own stories, you know. Um, you know, people have written operas about you know, a Chinese delivery guy who got stuck in an elevator for two days in, you know, Queens. And people have written, you know, um, uh, you know, there are great musicals written by non-Asian people that have Asian characters in them, you know, that where, where I, you know, I first learned what satire and irony was by listening to Steve Sondheim and John Weidman's um, Pacific Overtures, you know, there are, there are, as long as there's an opportunity to be a human being, whether that human being is a clown or a hero or um, anything in between, uh, I'm, I, I'm up for it. I, I will say, as, as the playwright, I feel at the end of the day, I get to write the play I wanna write. Even, even if I don't know what it is, you know, I'll figure it out. Whereas you actors, especially when it's a first production or a development workshop, what I would find terrifying if I were you, Francis, is that you're signing up for something that you're like, okay, you know, I'm playing this character, whatever it may be, and I think I know what it is, but that could shift. <laughs> and, and, and that, not that you're at the mercy of, you know, the writer and the director, but that there's there, it must be a lot of trust involved or potentially a lot of, a lot of fear because, you know, you want to support the project, but sometimes maybe the character you signed up for shifts into something else, you know. That's and totally true. I mean, a perfect example is the, this playwriting festival that you and director Josh Brody oh, yeah. invited me to come do, and, um, and also Joe No. You know, and mm -hmm. we arrive and we find out on the first day that the play that you had originally thought that we would read uh, for a week was not the play we were going to be doing. That instead, you were going to be doing this play set in Russia with two 
<laughs> young Russian guys uh, in their 20s, you know, right after the, you know, the fall of the Soviet Union and uh, the, of the Berlin Wall. And, and, and Joe and I looked at each other like, sure, okay, here we go. <laughs> you know, another example was, you know, um, uh, Lee, the great Lee Silverman, fabulous mm -hmm. director I've worked with several times, emailed me and she said, I want you to attach yourself to this project. It doesn't have a script, it doesn't have a name yet, but David Henry Huang is writing it. Mm -hmm. And so I want you to, to be available. And I was like, uh, okay. So I, I, I come in on a day when they finally have a reading and I'm playing this Chinese businessman meeting somebody who is representing David Henry Huang. And suddenly we're meeting Hillary Clinton. And then out of the blue, it, it's, I'm told it's going to be a musical and that Janine Tesori is writing the score. And then I get told, oh, you're not going to play the Chinese businessman anymore. We want you to play David. So I'm like, oh, 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 okay. <laughs> <laughs> and even then, playing David, it changed so much over the course of two, two and a half years of development um, before coming to the public, um, where it, 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 it started off as much more of a reverse King and I, and, and eventually became much more focused on the fact that David himself had been attacked, um, uh, probably for being Asian on the, on the street and in front of his house. And, um, and, and the fact that um, uh, Hillary Clinton lost this election and what, what is America now? And um, so, yeah, you know, but that's part of the fun of it. That's part of the reason why I've loved working with you, Lauren, because you write so quickly and you, you're you constantly challenging us to like, let's see if you can pick this up. Let's see if you can figure this out. And, um, you know, I'll never forget, you, you had scenes in King of the Yees with, you know, fortune cookie, you know, factory oh, yeah. with, with six arms. And it's like, yeah, yeah, I wrote that. You figure out how to make that work, you know? And, <laughs> you yeah. know, stuff like that. I think that's, that's the fun. So uh, we have a question from the internet. Hmm. Uh, this one's for Lauren. Can yeah. you talk a bit about what was productive and challenging about melding aspects of a rock concert show into hmm. a larger play slash musical? Ah, yeah. So, so for some context, uh, Cambodian rock band, when I started, uh, it initially, it was a play. It was a play about kind of this whole era of Cambodian rock history that, you know, not as many Americans know about. And, and I, you know, I was like, oh, you know, like you'll play uh, recordings of songs during intermission or curtain call, like it'll be like in the background somewhere. Uh, and then like, as I went along, just kind of like through delightful happenstance, you just like do workshops and you cast the best actors you can and then you find out they play uh, instruments. And then you say, oh, let's like bring that in and have everyone just see what's that, what that's like. And, and kind of as soon as that happened, I was like, oh, there should definitely be live music in this show because that, that, that is kind of the radical act that the Khmer Rouge was trying to eliminate. So let's put this music back on stage and bring it back to life. And, and so the way, and so like, so I had the script and I was like, okay, well, if we're gonna put in songs, let's just like song spot, let's just look to see where I could like stick a couple <laughs> songs in. And I was like, okay, at the top of the show, they're playing some songs. Um, oh, the band has just finished recording their album. Okay, they're gonna play a song right before that. Uh, at the at, right when we come back from intermission and at the end of the play. And then there's like a couple other spots where I figure out ways to like put the music in. Um, but I think it like kind of naturally began to reveal itself about like where the music should fit in. And one thing that like the director Che Yu helped me integrate in was like how the band lives on stage and in his production uh which was at signature 
they're the a big part of the set is this moving band platform uh you know just because it also takes a long time to set up instruments so you can't easily you know just move them aside so we had this band platform that kind of was on a track that could bring it you closer to the audience or further back and and what he does very simply and skillfully through the production is that for the most part except when we get uh into act two, at least for act one, the band is always there. And maybe they, the platform goes back a little and they retreat so the actors can do a scene and maybe they move forward, you know, when they're really part of that narrative um, in the past and, and you're able, you know, to see them up close. But I think, like, I think what Che was trying to you know, highlight was the idea that, you know, this man goes back to Cambodia for the first time in 30 years and the music is almost, and this band is almost like a ghost, that it's um, kind of always there and it's partially out of practicality and it's partially out of um, like, a, you know, a sense of artistry. Uh, so I think not even having to like hit it, you know, too hard on the head, um, but just like having having the band there and also, you know, really having talented musicians who could help to figure out ways to integrate themselves in the music. Cause you know, there's times when we play songs, but there's also like little interludes or like bits and pieces of music that um, Abraham Kim and Jane Louie, who are the drummer and the keyboardist really helped to develop. I, I always thought that as much as the play was about um, the Khmer Rouge and mm -hmm. survival, the people who survived that trauma, mm -hmm. and a mother, a, a father daughter um, story, and an immigrant second generation story, mm -hmm. uh, that it was also um, a story about how dangerous artists are, mm -hmm. how, how yeah. telling stories, the act of telling stories itself. Is an act of revolution because yeah. you can you can change hearts and minds that way. You can mm -hmm. um, just the act of creating something. Um, there's a reason why authoritarians go after artists. Mm -hmm. There's a reason why they shut down, you know, theaters and um, uh, and uh, there was a reason why the Khmer Rouge banned music and art and um, until they knew how until they had enough artists in prisons to control what they produced. And, um, and so, I, you know, I, I think that that always was something that I could relate to now mm -hmm. um, as somebody who gets hired to tell stories. There's something um, about being live together in a room mm -hmm. um, that where anything could happen and, um, and often what happens is somebody's, you know, really affected by this, the story. Um, is, is, you know, look at me, um, 40 years later, after having seen one high school musical, you know, and, um, and, and how is it going to affect other people's views of themselves and of the world by just, you know, coming one night to, to the, 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 my biggest question about, about that is, did you always play the cowbell, Francis, or did you have to learn how to do that <laughs> for a Cambodian rock band? I thought, okay, I'm playing Doig. I'm playing this. I'm playing the one guy in the company who's not a member of the band, right? So I thought, oh, great. When they play this music in the script, it doesn't say anything about Doig participating. But as soon as I started rehearsals, people would sort of tenderly sneak up to me and say, um, how open are you to, I don't know, um, playing an instrument? Or um, do you think that during this part of this song, you'd feel the impulse to dance? And, and you know, it became, and then- What a setup. Yeah, yeah. And then like, how, how comfortable would you be jumping off the stage and, and, and like engaging the audience and getting them on their feet? And it was, it, you know, it, it, it was funny beca only because, you know, people were so afraid that I would just say no. And, and oftentimes I, I, I was like, really? You want me to do what? 
uh, and um, but as soon as I got into the um, theater space, and there was an audience, an actual people sitting in the audience, um, I, you know, I, I, I just that ham gene that I've got mm -hmm. clicks in, and it's about, you know engaging them in a way where they feel like they're in the band too. They're in this world. And, uh, uh, and, and I re I, I, that's one of the things I enjoy the most, actually, as much as it almost killed me. <laughs> it, it truly was something I really, really enjoyed. Yeah. And you can hear Francis play the cowbell on the Cambodian rock band. Oh, yes. Album. <laughs> <laughs> and the tambourine. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Yes. Special skills. <laughs> uh, we have another comment. Um, to add to, on to Francis's point, I think it's time for directors to step up and change existing materials. Why can't Waitress just be entirely Asian casted? People aren't thinking about these things. Hmm. And so, you have one yellow person in a show and suddenly it's like an Asian show. I mean, that's not just true of us. You, you know, you cast a black person as one romantic lead and suddenly it's a statement of some kind. And that's not to say that casting non-traditionally doesn't make a statement. It, not, it, it's, it should be something that you talk about, but like, isn't it still a love story if there are two Asian people kissing on stage? You know, I, it, it, yeah, truly. Yeah. And Lauren's doing it. Lauren is writing it. Yeah, I'm, because you know, I mean, we 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 all know David Henry Huang, and and we all, and you know, and his pro and the protest he led around Miss Saigon in in 1990 mm -hmm. around like casting not casting white people to play Asian people. I mm -hmm. feel like. I feel like we've progressed from white people no longer getting to play Asian people and not getting called out on it to, you know, Asian people finally being able to like lead stories. And so where mm -hmm. do you, where, where would you all like the future to go? Oh, it's a wow. great question. I, hmm. I feel like our brains right now are so geared towards like the short term future. <laughs> like, like I think that's actually true right now that it's hard to be like, wow, like in five to 10 years or 20 years or 30 years. Um, Lauren, do you, think, Lauren do, you think that, do you think that we do you think that we've had um, our raisin in the sun? You know, do you think we've had that hmm. cultural touchstone moment where um, finally we are just human beings, where blackface is no longer acceptable, where, mm -hmm. um, there's just no room anymore for any of that. Do you think that we've had that moment yet? I'm not, I'm not sure if we've had that moment yet. Um, I, I will say, I, I think that there's, there's kind of like an amazing depth and breadth to like Asian American theater that like, there are just so many different types of stories being told um, from so many different facets. And I think just like, as a writer, it just makes me breathe a sigh of relief because that you, you and I and everyone else are not on the hook to represent every single type of Asian American and every type of experience that, that you can, on, on a given performance, you, you can represent this particular character at this particular time and that you that you don't have to worry about someone being like well you know this was also true about you know this type of person at the time you know so it's, so i think that's just like like a relief that there there's almost like a wonderful deluge of people who who are there to help tell those stories that like one thing that was so great about the Asian American nights at Cambodian rock band uh, that we did at Signature was that I didn't know everyone there. There were all these performers and writers and musical theater composers that I didn't know yet who were kind of, who are coming up and doing work and 
going through degree programs or doing it on their own um, that like I find amazing. So true, so true. Right, I, I, I wonder if the next step would be for like, for Asian American stories or Asian stories to like have like that same universality because I don't know if y'all felt this, you know, with the reception of your work, but it mm -hmm. always feels to me like it's regarded as, oh, this story about these people, mm -hmm. instead of this is a story that I see myself in. Yeah, or, or I think that people see Asian American stories, like they, they see it, and usually it's a, like a white audience member who's like, my friend from China would love this. Or like, it's really, <laughs> like really about that. And maybe that's true, but I think even more so my plays are distinctly American um, in, in a way that like, I think the, the test is if you took it say to Japan or China or somewhere and you translated it, would it read as well? And I think the answer is, it might be interesting, but no, because I think the plays of mine that are specifically about Asian American identity are be about being, say, an outsider in your own culture, um, which is which is potentially different. You know, like in China, it's it's a much much more homogenous culture that being Chinese in China is not the same as being Chinese uh, Chinese America in, in America. So I will say too that um, I met a lot of audience members after Cambodian mm -hmm. rock band who were not Asian, but related mm -hmm. in intense ways. Mm -hmm. you know, because um, New York is such a city of immigrants, mm -hmm. uh, you know, even if it's from Europe, you know, there are people who talked about how they they were inspired to ask their parents mm. about things um, or were um, reconsidering how they wanted their children to know them, what mm. they wanted their children to know about them, um, things like that after seeing Cambodian rock band. Because to a certain extent, and, and not to the specifics of you know, um, the Khmer people, but to you know, there are lots of other people who have trauma in their in their lives and in their families' backgrounds that gets inherited even when it's not expressed. And um, so I, I heard a lot of that from people, um, and that to me is really revolutionary. I mean, you know, um, compared to other shows where I, where I have felt like audience members thought it was a real great sort of cultural experience seeing the show, you know, um, as though they'd, as though they'd, they'd been to a museum or, or a zoo, you know, and, um, but it, with Cambodian rock band, with King of the Yees, um, even it was soft power. Um, uh, I, I've been, I have felt so lucky um, that I, I have really felt like audiences identified in ways that saw through the specifics in each of those plays. Well, um, we're at two minutes before nine, so I believe Rachel is going to come back and lead us out, but thank you, Francis and Lauren, for this wonderful conversation. And I just, I just think this was a great conversation, and I feel like the, the kind of um, ethical exploration really took us in a number of different directions. I really thinking about what if Cambodian rock band was played in Cambodia? And what if they thought of this as American play? Mm. And, you know, I, I think it would read in a very different way. And there are so many layers to, to so much of what's been shared tonight. Uh, but essentially, this is an American story that we're, we're all continuing to figure out. And uh, I'm really happy that we also started to look into the future. So I hope we get a chance to do this again. Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing you all in person. Yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Thank you on a so stage. much. <laughs> um, I just wanted to let our viewers know that we do have a program tomorrow morning at 10 a.m with our museum colleagues. 
uh, preserving legacy and scholarship in, in publications. Uh, that's with the Asia Society Museum, and that'll be at 10 a.m. And uh, as you've noticed, the Asia Society is proud to be offering uh, this content free of charge right now at a time when we're sharing uh, a different kind of experience. If you're watching on YouTube, uh, just so you know that, that we're also seeking help uh, and you can always donate at asociety.org. But really, I just wanna thank all three of you for being so generous and thoughtful. And, uh, and hopefully uh, we'll have you again on this platform soon. Thanks. I hope so too. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you.